Hello everybody, I'm Theo Hartzell, and in today's video, I want to look at and answer the question of what biblically is the five-fold ministry as found and referenced by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. What is an apostle? What's a prophet? What's an evangelist? What's a pastor? What's a teacher? How do they manifest their role? Who are they? How do we identify them? What authority and jurisdiction do they have? What are the Greek words for these terms? And can we learn any more and study anything about them to to help me identify whether I am one of the five-fold ministry. And not only that, but you may be trying to figure out in your own life what role or what position you feel in the church. And maybe you feel one of these callings on your own life, so you want to have a deeper and fuller understanding of what the scriptures are actually saying. Now, one way that I really think is a beautiful and simple way to describe the five-fold ministry is what I heard Lee Stone King talk about at a book cause of the Times Conference in 2005. He said the apostle governs the church, the prophet guides the church, the evangelist gathers the church, the pastor guards the church, and the teacher grounds the church. And I think that's just a beautiful way to think about these offices as a governing, guiding, gathering, guarding, and grounding the assembly or the church together. Because when you look at Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, it says, this, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. What is the fivefold ministry for? To perfect the saints to do work of the ministry and to edify the body of Christ. Now, just because somebody might operate here and there in the gift of prophecy and say something that comes to pass or something that comes true here and there does not necessarily mean that that person is called to the fivefold role of being a full-time prophet. The reason I'm saying that is because when someone is an office or a role, there is no separating that person from that role. That's why they were made. That's why they were designed. Everything in their persona, everything in their imagination, everything in their heart, their DNA is to fulfill the design of why they were created and it is for that role. There are some people that are church planters and they love to build churches. They love to go into a region and build a church and come out of there with a church. It's in their blood and that's because they are called to be an apostle. There are other people who operate in the realm of a prophet. Everywhere they go, they're prophesying. They talk prophecy. Every Everywhere they go, they're prophesying and calling out stuff because they are a prophet. That is different than someone who temporarily operates in a manifestation here or there in a spirit of prophecy when a spirit of prophecy comes on someone. All right, now as we start to dig into what specifically is the fivefold ministry, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, one of the first things that I want to explain to you is the first thing that you have to become is you have to become a disciple of Jesus. Jesus Christ. Let me explain. The Greek word for disciple is the Greek word 3101 mathetes, which means a learner, a pupil, one who follows someone's teaching. I would explain it like this. A disciple is someone who has come under the stewardship of a teacher to learn everything they can from that person. They're under their stewardship, they're under their training, and they're learning everything they can from that person. The reason that's important is because before there was ever a New Testament church, before the disciples ever became apostles or prophets or evangelists or pastors or teacher, before there was ever an organization or an assembly, they were disciples of Jesus Christ. Jesus came alongside of them in their life and said, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And they abandoned their vocation, they abandoned their calling of life, and they became a disciple or a follower of Jesus Christ. And when people think about disciples, they normally get locked up in thinking specifically and only about the 12 disciples by name and not realize that Jesus actually had a whole lot more disciples than the 12. In fact, when you look at Luke chapter 10 verse 1 it says after these things the Lord appointed unto 70 also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place wherewith he himself would come 
And one of the reasons that I want to highlight this word mathetes, disciple, is because I want you to understand there is a massive difference between being a follower of Jesus and being a disciple of Jesus. There's lots of people that want to follow Jesus because they're in love with seeing the signs, wonders, and miracles. They love getting the loaves and fishes. They love receiving the blessing and the benefit of following Jesus because there's all these tangible benefits of following Jesus. They love love seeing the sick get healed. They love seeing the dead get raised. They love hearing all the wonderful things he's preaching because he's attacking the Pharisees and the Sadducees and he's attacking all these people and all this stuff trying to get there to be justice and righteousness and they're all on board and they're like, man, this is the greatest thing ever. We love following this guy. And that's one of the things that I see in people's lives a lot is they think they're a disciple of Jesus when in fact they're only a follower of Jesus. They're moved by his word. They're moved by his scriptures. They're moved by his his presence. They're moved by his feeling. They're moved by the word of God. They're moved by wonderful anointed preaching. Yet when it comes the time for the rubber to meet the road and for them to actually step into the next level and become a disciple where they're expected to change their life, change their way of thinking, change their way of talking, they start to backpedal and say, wait, 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 wait. I don't know if I'm up for that. I want to be a follower, but I don't want to be a disciple. That's important because if you think about a student who is in class with a teacher, or a mentor or someone who's transferring a skill or a trade to someone. There's a curriculum, there's homework, there's test. You have to be challenged. You have to be graded. Sometimes you have to be corrected. Sometimes you have to be rebuked. And so sometimes I see this in people's lives that it's so much easier to just be a follower than it is to be a disciple. So the first thing that I would tell you or ask you or challenge you to in this video as you want to identify, are you an apostle or a prophet or an evangelist or a pastor or a teacher or where do you fit in God's church? is have you moved from a follower of Jesus who is moved by his presence, moved by his word, moved by inspirational quotes and scriptures, and have you become a disciple of Jesus Christ where he can discipline you or correct you or challenge you or give you homework? Or are you manifesting a lifestyle of discipleship under Jesus Christ and allowing him to tell you where to go, how to go, when to go, who to pray for, what to sing, when to sing, not to sing, what to to do, when to go, and all this other stuff, and you're actually trying to become more like Jesus because that's the first thing you have to do is you have to become a disciple instead of a follower. Now I want to dig into the apostle and explain what the apostle is. The Greek word for apostle is the Greek word 652, apostolos, and it means a delegate, an ambassador. In other words, it's like an official from another kingdom. It means a messenger, one sent forth with orders. It means to act as an ambassador. When I think about the Greek word apostle from all of my study, I would say it like this. It is a person given a position and rank of authority with the commission to go and the commands to carry it out as they go and upon arrival of said destination. It is a person given a position and rank of authority with the commission to go and the commands to carry it out as they go and upon arrival of said destination. They have the power, authority, rank, and jurisdiction to carry out God's mission, plan, and purpose to which they were sent. And so you might say, well, what is the difference then between an apostle and a disciple? Because in the New Testament Bible, they were called disciples all the time and they were also called apostles. I would clarify it as a distinction like this. As long as they are a disciple, they are a student. They are in class. They have a teacher. They're being mentored. They're being rebuked. They're being taught what to do, how to do it, when to do it. But when it flips over and they then become the apostles, it's like the class session is over. The teacher is gone. Now it's time for you to take everything that the teacher has taught you, mentored you, and showed you what to do. And now it's time for you to go do it yourself. They were disciples as long as they were under Jesus, but then there came a point in time when Jesus physically left the earth and then he commissioned them to go. And at that point, then I would say that they would technically become classified as apostles or the sent ones. In other words, they made a transition from student to teacher, from follower to leader, from the one being fed to the one who was going to do the feeding. They are literally transitioning from come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men to go ye into all the 
world and make disciples. A way that I could explain an apostle to you, at least in my mind, and you probably don't need me to explain to you what a modern day missionary is, but a modern day missionary in my mind is what I would consider like to be an apostle. A missionary specifically means one that is called out for a mission. They leave everything that they have behind. They go to a place that they might not even know exactly where they're going. They might not even have the funds to get there. They don't even know how it's all going to work out. And so they set out course and they leave everything else behind. They may be going to another country, another region, another place. There might not even be a church there. There may be no assembly there. There may be no funds or organization when they get there, but they're going to have to go into that place. They're going to have to establish and build a new church and get home churches going. They're going to have to put a governance and ordinances and bylaws and rules and regulations in place to protect the assembly, protect the church finances, protect everybody involved. They're going to have to put the organization in place, get the network together. They're going to have to appoint leaders, pastors, deacons, and put them over the church, put them over the assembly, give them the rank authority and power to implement the authority that they've been granted to carry out. They're going to have to step in a referee when there's a problem in the organization or between pastors or other religious movements or even between churches or assembly groups together. Maybe even if there's strife in the church itself. When you look at the Apostle Peter and the other apostles and how they laid out the New Testament church, they set criteria. They laid out how the funds of the church were going to be dispensed. They laid out how the funds were going to be governed. They said who could be in the collection, who could receive funds from the church who could not. They established criteria for that. They even gave accountability requirements and said who was going to be in the assembly and who not to have in the assembly and who to expel from the assembly. And when people came to them with problems and issues, they even said, you know what, we're not going to take time away from praying and fasting to take care of these matters. I want you to pick out seven men and they appointed them as deacons. And when I think about an apostle or a missionary, normally they're in charge of a whole country or a whole region and therefore they're responsible for many churches and many assemblies underneath them. Not only do they have the burden of implementing all the organization network and making sure there's all of the pastors and deacons and everybody in place and making sure there's a network of rules and bylaws and restrictions and organizations so that everybody is accountable and people can't just go crazy everywhere but they also had to have the power of God working with them because when you look at the apostles in the New Testament Bible, they were going where they went with signs, wonders, and miracles following, and even their shadow cast over someone would get them healed, and they would have garments taken from their body and sent to someone else, and when the garments touched that person, they would be instantly healed. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs, and wonders, and mighty deeds. And so some people might say, well, only the 12 disciples were the ones that were turned into the apostles. And that is not true because the apostle Paul was counted as an apostle and so was Barnabas. When you look at Acts chapter 14, verse 14, it says, which when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people crying out. That word right there is the Greek word 652, apostolos. It says in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of Christ. Romans eleven thirteen. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle, of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Paul and Barnabas didn't have the luxury of walking three and a half years with Jesus. And one thing that I will tell you about the apostles is that when they were commanded to go, they didn't sit at their house anymore. They didn't sit at a local assembly in a church anymore. When Jesus told them to go ye in all the world, they actually obeyed that and they went. They left the building. They got out in the street. They walked through the highways, the byways. They got in the marketplaces. And I don't want to take the time to go into all the different places that the 12 disciples or apostles in particular went. But if you read church history and if you read some of the accounts of where they went, they were scattered. They went through all of Asia Minor. They went through Europe. They went to Greece. They went to Italy. They went to Rome. They went through the Assyrian and Babylonian empires, the Mesopotamia area. And some of them even went so far as to go over to India. But the point I'm making is that an apostle is not only called, but they actually go. And when they get 
there, they start establishing and building in churches and they put a network in place and they get the governance in place and they get the rules and regulations and the bylaw and the accountability. They start appointing leaders and they start getting the whole work going because they're normally building it from the ground up. They go into a place where there's not even a believer and by the time they're done with that city, there is a church established with a pastor, with deacons, with organization and a fully functioning body and they go to the next place because they're an apostle. Now the next office I want to look at is the prophet and it is the Greek word 4396 prophetes and it means the one who received the oracle to tell beforehand, to foretell future events, to exhort, to reprove, and threaten individuals or nations as an ambassador of God and the interpreter of his will to men. But I want you to notice this according to the Word Study Bible Dictionary. It says this Greek word, prophetes, is also used of any friend of God to whom he makes known his will, such as Abraham. One reason I'm saying that is because because not only is this Greek word prophetes talking about someone who foretells events or brings the judgment and the commands of God and tells, thus saith the word of the Lord unto you, but it is also being used in the extent of someone who is a friend of God and receives direction from the Lord or a word of correction for someone and someone is getting a prophetic word or a declaration or an unction or an anointed word. And as I talk about prophets here, I want you to think about prophets from the Old Testament because you you see many times that a prophet of God would get a dream or a vision or a revelation or an understanding or they would make an axe, a metal axe head float to the top of the water, call fire down from heaven. There could be many numbers of signs, wonders, and miracles, but that's because they are a prophet of God and they've got a prophetic word. When I look at the Old Testament, I'm not only thinking about people like Elijah who was calling fire down from heaven or Elisha who was raising people from the dead or Jonah going to the Assyrian an empire and talking to the city of Nineveh and saying, you better repent or you're going to die in 40 days. But I also think about Abraham, who the Bible says was a friend of God. And the Bible says that Abraham was a prophet of God. I think about David, who was also a prophet of God. And the reason that I'm saying that is because if you're a friend of God, if God loves you, if you love God and you care about God, you can get prophetic words from the Lord. You might not be operating in 100% full-time capacity of a prophet like Elijah or Elisha, but if you're a friend of God, if you know God, if God knows you, you can get a prophetic word from the Lord. One of the Hebrew words for prophet is the Hebrew word 5030, Navi, and it means an inspired spokesman. It's a prophet that is like Jeremiah. They have a message to speak and they're going to speak it to anybody and everybody. The connotation or the meaning of the word is it's like a bubbling up. It's just coming up out of the individual or coming up out of the person. It just bubbles forth and spills forth out of them. Another Hebrew word is 7200, ra'ah, and it means a seer. It means to look, to see, to perceive, to observe, to watch, or to look upon. Another Hebrew word is 2374, Jose, which means a beholder in a vision. It's a seer. And I don't want to take the time in this video to explain to you the difference between a prophet and a seer. I will make a completely separate video about that. In the prophetic realm, there are normally two different primary ways that the prophet of God is receiving the word of the Lord. There is the one who receives it by an oratory experience. It may be in their mind or come bubbling up out of their belly, but they just have a way to talk and they can speak it very well and it comes bubbling up out of them like the prophet Nathan to David. The prophet Prophet Nathan gave a beautiful story about this little lamb who was taken from its rightful owner and given to this evil rich person and it struck David to the core of his heart. He sent us to judgment only to find out that Nathan said, you are the man and it struck David to his core. And then yet David had another prophet named Gad who was a seer who saw and received from the Lord in a completely different manner. Gad didn't have a beautiful eloquent word to come tell David and to get his emotions super, super high. 
by only to have the story come crashing down and realize that he was the guilty person. The prophet Gad operated in a seer realm and said, here's the word of the Lord. Here's what I saw. Moving on about the prophet, you will see as you look through the Bible about these individuals is often they are telling leaders, congregations, assemblies, nations what to do, how to do it, when to do it. They were anointing kings to be kings. They were pulling kings down. They were heralding, thus saith the word of the Lord, and you better get things in alignment, and you better get your heart made up to serve the Lord God. And one thing that I'll say right here about a difference between a prophet and a pastor is when you look at the Bible and you study it out, you will see that normally the prophet has been to the Lord, he has received a word from the Lord, and he comes to the people and gives them the word from the Lord. On the other hand, when you look at the pastor, the pastor has been to the people and he goes to the Lord on behalf of the people saying, here's the people's issue, here's the problem, here's the question, here's the challenge, here's the issue, and I need to know what you want to say about the issue, and then they take the word from the Lord and go back to the people. And I understand that sometimes this can end up blending together because you see that many times Moses, as a prophet of God and as a pastor over the people, was often spending much time with the Lord, getting a word from the Lord, and then delivering that word to the people. But then you would also see that he would transition because he was having to spend time with the people in the daily organization and the functioning of the tabernacle and the sacrifices and telling the people what to do. And he was giving them ordinances and governance and challenge and deciding in matters and being a judge over them and giving all of this stuff and telling them what to do. And then when there was a question or something or a challenge, he would go to the Lord and say, what do you want to say about this? And there was just this dialogue back and forth. Listen to what the Bible says in Acts chapter 15, verse 32. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves. I want you to understand, you can look all through the New Testament, and there is a prophetic office going on all over the place. In fact, the Bible says that Philip had four daughters that did prophesy. They were prophetesses. Yes, girls can prophesy. Judas and Silas were prophets. In fact, there was a prophet named Agabus who came down and gave a word to Paul and said, this is what's going to happen if you go to Jerusalem. You're going to end up in Rome. You're going to be killed for the gospel's sake. A scripture that I want to bring to your attention to show you something really neat is 1 Corinthians 14 and 29. It says, Let the prophets speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. The reason I'm highlighting that verse is because that word revealed there, which is what the prophet is doing, is 601 apocalypto, which means to remove a veil or a covering, exposing to open view view what was hidden before to make manifest or reveal a thing previously secret or unknown. It means disclosure, revelation, divine instruction to uncover or unveil. So here's what I would tell you. If you want to learn how to be a prophet, if you want to begin to move in the prophetic realm, if you want to get a prophetic unction, a prophetic anointed word from God on behalf of a congregation, assembly, and a nation, somebody in your family, somebody in your church, then I would would ask you begin to pray for revelation. Begin to pray for God to open your eyes. And I think one of the best things you could do is go to the book of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17 and 18 and begin to read those scriptures over yourself every single day and pray for God to open the eyes of your understanding. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17 says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. I would tell you to begin to pray and ask God, give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation and open the eyes of my understanding so that I can get these prophetes words, these prophetic words that I can minister like you want me to minister. And I want to talk about the evangelist next. The Greek word for evangelist is the Greek word 2099, yongili stace, and it means to evangelize. Thayer's Greek Dictionary 
3 says it is a bringer of good tidings, a name given to New Testament heralds of salvation through Christ who are not apostles. In other words, they're another class or another role. The Bible says in Acts chapter 21 verse 8, And the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 5 says, But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. What is an evangelist doing? An evangelist is someone who is not tied down to a local congregation and ministering there. They're not an apostle who is going into a whole country and trying to establish and build churches and networks and put all the governance and restrictions and bylaws and build a church and assembly and appoint pastors and leaders and deacons and everybody and build a whole assembly. But what the evangelist is doing is the evangelist is going into a region or an area and bringing a thus saith the word of the Lord. They're bringing revival fire. They're trying to get things kicked up. They're trying to get the people motivated. They're trying to get the people back on fire. They're trying to teach and educate people. They're trying to minister and bring healing and restoration to the people. They're trying to restore family. They're trying to preach the good news of the gospel. And one thing that I would say about an evangelist is they could be operating in a twofold manifestation. Number one, when you look at the New Testament Bible, normally they're going into unpreached areas, uncharged areas, unchurched areas, and they're going in and preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. They're making footholds. They're going in and trying to preach the word. They're planting seeds. They're trying to talk to people about God, just like Jesus sent the disciples out, and he said, go out, and they ministered two by two, and then they came back. Do you know what they were going out and doing? They were operating in a role, in a manifestation of an evangelism. They were making preaching points. They were going out and laying the word of God and the seed of God so that someone could come back later and establish an assembly and do something great and get a house church or a church established or a, a church assembly built. And one thing that I can tell you about the evangelists that I know or someone that has an evangelist slant in them is that they can't stop talking about Jesus. They minister and talk about Jesus everywhere they go. They may be operating in the role of a prophet or a pastor or some other role, but the evangelist-minded person is talking Jesus everywhere they go. They want everybody to be saved. They can see a bird sitting up in a tree and they can get a message about that and tell someone who's sitting beside them about that and somehow spin it into God and try to lead them to Jesus Christ and get them baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. And not only are these people that are evangelists moving and ministering in areas where there's no churches and new areas that have been unchurched, but they also come in alongside of pastors and missionaries and apostles and they come in and they try to breathe life into a congregation and they come in and they minister and they teach and they try to bring healing and they try to bring comfort and exhortation and heal the body. And I have seen great revival start because an evangelist will come into a church assembly that maybe has lost its passion, lost its fire. Maybe there's some problems in the church. Maybe there's issues and strife going on inside of the assembly in the church. And when that evangelist comes in with a fresh word and a fresh touch and a fresh anointing and they're on fire with God, they come in, they clean the plow, they clean clean things up. They straighten things out. They haven't been told anything, but the Word of God is speaking through them, and they get a lot of things straightened out. They rekindle fire. They rekindle passion. They get people stirred up. They get people on fire. They start beating the street. There's new congregates come. There's new people come, and Holy Ghost fire breaks out, and people start getting baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. There's signs and wonders and miracles because they have brought an infusion of enthusiasm, passion, strength, and burden from the Lord. I love evangelists, and if you have a desire to get out there and beat the street and evangelize and talk to people and witness everywhere you go and you love to go into churches and get them on fire and share your burden and share your passion and get people healed and get things straightened out and bring comfort, exhortation, and joy, then you might be an evangelist at heart and you might have an evangelistic streak and you might be fulfilling a different role right now, but you have an evangelism streak in you. And I found one thing about evangelists and I see in my own life is that if they start pastoring a church, you can't take 
take the evangelism out of them and they manifest evangelism because they have an evangelistic heart and they want people to be saved. The next one I want to talk about is the pastor and it is the Greek word 4166 poimain and it means a shepherd, one who cares for the flocks. According to the Thayer Greek Dictionary, it means the presiding officer, manager, director of an assembly, overseer of the Christian assemblies. Listen to John chapter 10, verse 11 through 14. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and I am known of mine. One thing I'll say about pastors is they come in many different flavors and many different sizes. I've seen pastors that are introverted, some that are extroverted, some that are alpha males, some that are really laid back and don't let things get them wound up. There's some that are really high High strung and the smallest thing can get them wound up and spun completely out of control. I've seen pastors that can take the smallest thing you've ever seen and by the time it's done it's got the church split wide open. They've created more drama than you've ever imagined in your whole life. And then there's other pastors that are absolutely loving, caring. Things don't get them riled up. They just love people. They just care about people. They just want people to be blessed. They want people to grow. They want people to mature. So pastors are people also. They're human beings. They have emotions. They have a way of thinking. They have a mindset. They have a way they were raised. They're a human being just like you are. But one thing I'll say about the pastor is normally the pastor is the one who is responsible for the hands-on functioning of the sheep or the flock or the assembly of the bodies of Jesus Christ. The reason I'm saying that is because they're taking care of the daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly needs of the church assembly, the people that are in the church body. They're taking care of children's dedication. They're taking care of weddings and funerals. They're going to visit people while they're sick and in the hospital. They're counseling people for all kinds of relationship problems, marriage problems, addiction problems. They're counseling people for all kinds of problems and issues. And sometimes people are calling them and sharing very intimate and secret things that they don't share with anybody else. The pastor is also responsible for taking care of all the funds of the church and making sure that all the bills are paid and making sure that they're in good standing with the legal authority authorities and the responsibilities and making sure they're in good standing with the city. They're also responsible for many times of deciding how are the church funds going to be dispersed or dispensed in times of crisis or chaos or if there's someone in the church that is needy and needs help and needs funds. They're responsible many times for working with the city in times of crisis or calamity, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, whatever it is, and they need to reach out to the community. I would say this about the pastor that oftentimes they are the link between between the missionary or the apostle. They're the link between the prophet and the evangelist and the teachers, and they're the link that ties it all together. If there was not a church body or church assembly, then the evangelist wouldn't have somewhere to preach. There wouldn't be a church that had been established by the apostle turned over to a pastor for him to pastor the church assembly. The pastor's also wrestling with trying to keep strife out of the church assembly and making sure people's words are not taken out of context and making sure the rumor mill doesn't get running wild and people are running their mouth, running people down and saying all kinds of stuff that shouldn't be said. They're trying to make sure that peace is kept among the assembly and making sure that everybody's happy and everybody's taken care of and making sure that there's teaching curriculum for people and making sure that Sunday school teachers have got their curriculum and making sure that there's air conditioning going and making sure there's water for everybody to drink, making sure the bathrooms are functioning properly, making sure that the churchyard is grown, making sure the church building is not falling apart. The pastor has many responsibilities of the assembly. And one thing that I can tell you as a pastor, since I'm a pastor and from a pastor's perspective, is that as pastors, we need your love and prayer and support. We need your encouragement because not only are we wrestling with things going on in the church, not only are we wrestling with things that we feel and see that are going on in the church, but we might be privy to information that you don't have information about because it's been told to us 
us in secret. Not only that, we're wrestling with things that we're feeling in the spirit. And demon spirits are coming against us and trying to tear our mind up, trying to tear our home family apart, trying to tear our finances apart, trying to tear our witness in the community apart. And many times we're fighting spiritual battles, emotional battles, mental battles, and emotional battles that you may know nothing about because we are the link tying all of these offices together for the good of the edifying of the body. And if I could give you a takeaway about the pastor, just let them know that you love and appreciate them as a human being, not just as a pastor, but as a person because they're carrying all of this weight and they're trying to do what God wants them to do. And the pastor may feel like he's underqualified, may feel like they're inadequate, and the pastor may feel like they're inadequate, underqualified, not being everything that the church assembly needs, but they're trying to do the best that they can for the church assembly. The next officer role that I want to talk about is that of the teacher. It is the Greek word 1320 didaskalos, and it means one who is fitted to teach an instructor, one who teaches concerning the things of God and the duties of man. The Apostle Paul was a teacher. It says in 1 Timothy 2, 7, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher, an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ, and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. The Apostle Paul was not only an apostle, but he was operating in the prophetic realm many times. He was an evangelist because he was operating and going into places and preaching the gospel. He established and built churches, and therefore he was the pastor of the churches, and therefore he often moved into what was called a teacher realm or a teacher role or a teacher gift and began to teach and exhort people about the gospel. You may be moving and flowing in and out of all of these gifts all the time for your whole life. There may be times when you're operating in a prophetic realm and you're saying thus saith the word of the Lord in three days you're going to have this and this is going to happen and then you may be in a season in a row where you're operating in a realm of evangelism and you evangelize on the road for two three four five years whatever it is and then you may start pastoring a church and now you're a pastor and now you have to start teaching but one thing I will say about teachers is I have seen people that are evangelists pastors teachers apostles whatever you want to call them but they have an ability and a gift to teach they can take some something that is general and vague and wide and we don't really understand it in some general concept and by the time they get done explaining it you're like wow why didn't I know that 30 years ago I wish somebody would have told me that right off the bat that was some kind of concept that was just running around in my mind but by the time you got through dissecting that and breaking it down it was open to me and I understood it like I've never understood it in my life I wished I would have been taught that when I was a kid you don't have to be someone that has a license or a degree behind your name. You don't have to have a title. You don't even have to have an official position in the church for you to have a teaching gift inside you. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular, and God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, and after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Do you want to know what the apostle Paul was trying to tell you about the fivefold ministry? Pray about what is the most needed role or manifestation right now. Do I need a prophetic word? Do I need a prophetic unction? Do I need a manifestation of an evangelist gift right now where I'm running around beating the streets and trying to get people in the door? Or do I need to manifest the teaching gift because I need to ground and root the ones I've already got in the building and they need to know what to do and how to do it? If you have a gift to teach, whether you're in a local assembly or you're meeting together with believers in your home and you have a house church going on or whatever your condition or situation is, I want you to allow that teaching gift to be able to manifest through you because everybody needs to have a greater understanding of God's Word. And God has a place for teachers. You need to have the teaching gift manifested so that you can take followers of Jesus, turn them into disciples of Jesus, and 
and ultimately fit them in a five-fold ministry in the assembly or the church congregation. You've got to get busy doing the work of the Lord because all of us have been fitly framed together as a body of Jesus Christ and we've got to get busy doing the work of the Lord. And one way that I like to break these out as my own personal takeaway on the rank and the authority level and how these rank out is I classify these at the very top as the apostle. Many times the apostle is the head governing authority over the whole network, the whole organization, the whole movement, or all the bodies of whatever respective church assemblies he's over or she's over. Next in line would be the prophet because many times when you look at the Bible, they were assigned to a certain country over Israel, over Judah, over Assyria, over Babylon, and the prophet was assigned to that country or that group of people. The third in rank would be the evangelist because the evangelist is normally assigned to a region, and so I would put them as the third rank. And fourthly, I would put the pastors, and the pastor's rank and jurisdiction and authority is over the city that they have been assigned to and they are over. And fifthly, I would put the teacher there because their jurisdiction, rank, and authority is over the class that they're over or the class that they're teaching or the local assembly that they're teaching. But like I said, that's just my own personal takeaway of the rank and authority of these offices. God bless you. I hope this video has been a blessing to you and I hope you have a deeper and fuller understanding of what the fivefold ministry is, what it looks like, how it played out, how it manifested in the New Testament church. Father God, you see every one of the people that have followed me in this video. I ask you would bless them and touch them, touch their life, God. I'm asking you would speak to their heart right now and that you would raise them up to be prophetic words spoken out of their mouth. I ask that you would move upon them even right now to raise up and be prophets, evangelists, apostles, teachers, pastors, and you would start the fivefold ministry. God, let there be church assemblies that are born, home churches that are renewed. Move in our assemblies. Let the people be healed. Let signs and wonders manifest. God, I'm asking you to move in signs, wonders, and miracles among the body. Amen. God bless you, and thank you for sticking through this video with me. I pray this video has been a blessing to you. I may not know every single one of your names, but I try to pray every single day over my YouTube and my Facebook families, and I want to say thank you for honoring me by taking the time to watch these videos and allowing them to be a blessing to you. Amen. I really hate to hang up on these things because I enjoyed our time together. I feel like we're friends and family. I really love and appreciate you. I want you to know that I'm praying over you, my YouTube and Facebook family. So I love and appreciate you. I'll be praying for you and I'm asking you to pray for me. Until next time, I love you and I'll see you in the next one.